So my partner and I are getting ready to do some work with this equipment that you see behind me and that you may have seen behind me in several other of my videos. We're going to do experiments exploring the speed of sound around a lambda point in liquid helium, specifically the speed of first sound. There are some anomalies there and we're interested in seeing them. And we're not ready to do the experiment yet, but I am going to show you the setup. My guess is when we actually do the experiment, it'll be too hectic for me to actually film. But I will show you some of what we've been doing as we've been setting up for it. What you see there is the cryostat that we'll be using. Now what we're doing to actually measure the speed of sound is we're using a resonator. Now the resonator is already covered up, it's in that aluminum foil. And the reason why we can use a resonator to get the speed of sound is because the location of the resonant frequencies doesn't just depend on the shape of the cavity. It also depends on the speed of sound of the material the waves are in. And the speed of sound is affected by rigidity and density. So as that changes, as the helium cools, it'll be cooled evaporatively below its boiling point, which is where the liquid helium will start out at. But as it cools and the density changes and eventually phase transitions occur, we'll see differences in the speed of sound through differences in where the resonant frequencies are located. Now the resonator is in there. I've opened up the end a little bit so you could see. It's just a hollow metal cylinder with two end caps. Now these end caps have transducers and diaphragms on them to produce and pick up the sound and then we'll measure the amplitude in order to know when a resonance has occurred. We'll sweep frequencies so that we can find the resonances. I didn't film when I was putting this together but in that cap is an isolated piece of metal, cylinder of metal that is connected to that wire, an electrically isolated piece of metal. And against it is a mylar film with aluminum on the other side. An oscillating voltage can be applied to it to generate a sound wave. And that's basically the idea of a transducer. And then there's another one on this end, which is covered up with foil, another one on that end of the resonator. So basically one produces sound and the other picks it up and we look for spikes in the amplitude. One thing we're hoping to eventually do is do experiments with solid helium. Not sure if we'll be able to or whether we'll get to it, but we're working on the high pressure system now and we hope to use resonance to spot solidification because given that the speed of sound is dependent on rigidity and density change, the sudden change in density and rigidity when it freezes should cause a big spike in the speed of sound. So these wires that drive the transducer on one end and receive the signal from the other end ultimately connect here on this plate and head up the cryostat rod to the top here. And then we've got two coax cable connections there labeled A and B which connect to these wires that ultimately connect to the transducers. This foil is for electromagnetic shielding. This is a heater here and then this is a thermometer. I wish I'd thought to film before I put the resonator together and put it on the cryostat and put the foil around it. I don't want to undo it now, but it would have been cool to show you the inside. To try and show you what the inside of those parts look like, I've got some other similar parts here. This is one of those heads there. This piece of metal in the middle that's electrically isolated is what would work with the aluminum coated mylar to form a transducer and then you screw the electrical lead to it there. So that's what the end caps look like roughly. Then the central thing looks something like this. It's just a little cavity. So literally, if you're putting together one of these resonators, you take aluminum coated mylar and you put the mylar side on the piece of metal there so that you're not shorting it out. And then you put it on this on there and that's the cavity where the resonance actually occurs. And then you set the other one on top and then screw it all together and bolt it to the cryostat and you're done. Now, interestingly, there's another one here. You can see there's residue in it. That's aluminum oxide powder. This is used, not in our experiments, but it's used uh, for fourth sound measurements. Basically, they put aluminum oxide grit, really fine stuff in there, and then they use this to pack it down with a hydraulic press. Now the idea there is to immobilize the normal fluid component of superfluid helium and just study sound traveling in a superfluid component, and that's fourth sound. In order to do experiments with the liquid helium, we need to reach really low temperatures, and we're going to do that by sticking the cryostat I showed you with the resonator on it in a bath of liquid helium that will be vacuumed down 
to the lambda point. And this is the doer we're gonna do this in. We've got a vacuum jacket and then a liquid nitrogen layer and then another vacuum jacket and then a liquid helium inner doer. And that liquid helium bath is what this will be put in. Now it's worth pointing out that the inner vacuum jacket around the helium doer separating the liquid nitrogen doer from the liquid helium doer is not actually pure vacuum. In order to get it pretty cool the liquid nitrogen temperature before you put the helium in, we put a few tor of nitrogen gas in that vacuum jacket in order to allow heat to conduct away from the inner doer into the nitrogen. And then the nitrogen also adds an extra layer of thermal shielding. You see there's a gap in the silvering there that allows you to see what's going on inside. Now the vacuum jackets help stop heat transfer by convection and conduction and then the silvering helps avoid heat transfer by radiation. The top of the doer here where we put the cryostat looks like this. There's a cover over it to keep dust from falling in it. But if we look inside, you can see all the way down there. And at the bottom, there's a thermometer built into the bottom of the doer that will tell us the bath temperature. Then here, we've got a bunch of equipment on racks, some of which will be used for our experiments. And this is the primary vacuum pump for cooling the helium down below its boiling point, which is the temperature at which the helium sits at when we get it. Now, during this experiment, it actually takes quite a while. You have to pre-cool it, and that takes about a day and there's a auto filling of liquid nitrogen in the outer liquid nitrogen doer which makes sure it doesn't evaporate away and warm back up again and that goes on for the entire experiment and then the experiment itself is kind of complicated and chaotic and takes about a day and then the warm-up takes quite a while afterwards so it's pretty intense to get data. Now we'll operate the lock and amplifiers with a LabVIEW program. My partner wrote the LabVIEW program and when he gets back here I'll have him explain to you how it works. Here you see helium and nitrogen cylinders. Now we're not going to be using that in our first sound experiment in liquid helium, but if we manage to do the high pressure stuff, then we'll need to use it in order to pressurize the liquid helium inside a special cell. I'll show you some of the pieces that we have for our high pressure system already that may allow us to do the solid helium experiment. You can see here we've got a high pressure regulator, meaning you can achieve high output pressures with it. This will be necessary because we want to reach the 400 or so PSI, about 25 atmospheres, 25 to 30 atmospheres, that will be required to study solid helium at the temperatures we're dealing with, which will be between 1.6 and 1.8 Kelvin. Now the volume of the system that we'd be pressurizing is so small if we didn't have a ballast tank that the pressure would be very hard to keep constant because there'd inevitably be tiny leaks. So we bought this cylinder here, which will act as a ballast volume. It really just serves to increase the volume of our high pressure system to make the pressure more constant. This here is the cold trap that we're gonna be using to purify the helium from the cylinder. Basically, we'll have a sealed pressure cell that does not have helium in it at first, immersed in the vacuumed helium bath in there to keep it really cool to get it within the 1.6 to 1.8 Kelvin range. Then we're going to put helium gas through this cold trap here and through that ballast cylinder from the commercial cylinder into the cryostat where it'll condense down to a liquid and then we'll keep adding it in to raise the pressure until we detect solidification. Then we'll use the same LabVIEW program, lock-in amplifiers, and first sound resonator in order to detect when it's solidified. So here is the pressure cell we're dealing with. We're having it made by the local shop out of 303 stainless steel. This is the can, the pressure can, that we were going to use for solid helium. We were going to put our resonator in this, but we decided that the copper was too weak at the given thickness we've got for it to take the kind of pressure we were going to put it under. You can see the indium seal there. We're going to still use an indium seal, but we have a stainless steel version being made with thicker walls that will easily be able to take the required pressure. Then this plumbing here is a bit of the high pressure system that we've been able to put together. If we do get to do the solid helium experiments, it's worth pointing out that we won't be using the same cryostat. We'll be using this cryostat, which is a capillary cryostat. So we've got more than just coax cables there for the resonator. We've also got ports where we can put in gas. Those are the ports here and these are the valves that control them and then these tubes go up into the top here and then go all the way down the tube of the cryostat 
all the way down to the business end and right now nothing's mounted on it when we actually do the experiment there will be a can mounted on it that will take the pressure and inside that a resonator there are little coax cables right here which get the signal the cap of the pressure cell that we'll, we'll be using is over here getting repaired you see there are three coax cable inputs and these two things right here are the capillary tubes this is the inside and you can see that there have been repairs there at the coax inputs they were leaking this is sort of an interesting thing that really has nothing to do with any of the experiments we're going to do but i figured you'd like to see it this is an annular resonator other groups were using it to study i think fourth sound i don't really remember but there are four transducers the actual resonator cavity is annular and it's in there and it's all connected uh, the four transducers there's one right here that's one and then these are the other three exactly how it was used I don't really know but it's kind of cool to see an annular resonator like that they were using this on the cryostat we're using for our first sound measurements in liquid helium not the one that we're going to use for solid helium experiments in the high pressure apparatus that we're going to use for solidifying helium we need to be able to measure high pressures pretty accurately so we've got this brand new high pressure gauge that we're going to be using for that so this is the diagram for the pressure system for our high pressure solid helium experiments that we're looking to do this is the cylinder of helium that will be pressurizing it this is the high pressure regulator this is the stop valve and we'll be using copper tubes and we'll be pumping it into this ballast cylinder that ballast cylinder i showed you earlier and this is the pressure gauge and this is the cold trap the idea is that we can put helium in here pressurize it to a certain pressure then close off the tank the helium tank there and then most of the helium we'll be using will be right here and we can pass it back through the cold trap into the cell where it'll condense down and then eventually solidify we're getting ready to bench test it the resonator in air at room temperature We've got the coax cables hooked up that go to the lock and amplifier. This is the lock and amplifier that we're going to use to generate and detect the electrical signals for the transducers in the resonator. It'll generate the signal that drives one of the transducers to produce the sound in the resonator and the other one will detect the signal from the transducer that detects the sound at the other end of the resonator. And we are going to operate the lock and amplifier with this here lab view program which my partner will explain in the next clip okay so now brock is going to explain the lab view program that we're going to use to look for the resonance frequencies now brock remember i can edit so don't worry about being charismatic or smooth you can let your true personality through take it away <laughs> okay so okay. basically all that this left hand side does is it's just initializing our lock and amplifier so all it sets is just every single initialization kind of component that we want. So when we go to the kind of operating panel here, we just set everything that we want to have set up. So single end voltage, what our amplitude for our sine wave will be, and it can tell us then what it's measuring for the voltage and how many loops it's done and the sensitivity we want. So that just all sets it right when the program starts. So that's all this does. And then essentially all we want our lock-in to do is just sweep through a bunch of frequencies. So what I've done is I've created a while loop that will just go across the whole range. So this 100 and 2000 is just saying it. So it's gonna run through every single frequency for that, for all of them. And then it'll stop once it gets there. Or if I press the stop button, we can stop our program if we need to. And essentially all it does is so once it starts up, it's gonna set this tells it what frequency to start at. So I have it starting at zero. And then once it completes one, I use a shift register just to say, okay, add one, and then it does one, and then two, and so on and so forth till we reach this condition to stop the loop. And then all this does, this little icon with the glasses and kind of number and parameter sign here. All I've told it is to measure one parameter that we just called X for our X input for our graph. And it's just gonna measure the voltage and record that in this little DAC assistant. And so what this ends up doing is this just builds a graph for every single frequency as our X and the measured voltage for Y. And so when we do this, it'll plot our graph if we actually had an input signal. And then all we've done here is this just tells the lock-in to close once we stop our program or it stops automatically. And all this does is it just takes our data. So this will show us the graph in real time, but this, once we're completely done with our program, imports it into a CSV file 
so that we can just plug that into MATLAB or Excel or whatever program we want to use to analyze the data. Previously in the video I said that I'd already put the foil on and tied on with floss, the heater, and the thermometer, and I couldn't show you the resonator really, but we had some trouble with bench testing it, so we took off the foil anyway to see what was going on. We still haven't yet quite figured it out, but still I decided to film what the resonator looked like. So the next step will be to fiddle with it until we get a successful bench test, then we'll put it back in the doer I showed you earlier, and we'll test it again, and then we'll consider doing a run with actual helium to get data. That won't be in this video, that'll probably be in a different video, assuming I can manage to film it. So I originally tended in this video just to talk about the preparations we were making for the liquid helium first sound experiments we're going to do, but then I saw the equipment we were putting together for the solid helium experiments as well, and so then I ended up showing you both. So that's why suddenly that showed up in the video. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any suggestions for things we ought to do that may make our experiments more successful or whatever, put it in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. Dietrich out.